Awesome. All right, so we'll try to stay awake for a little bit. We'll fall asleep here in a few. Um, because we'll do some deeper, deeper meditations here towards the end, but we'll still do some more of the heady story stuff here. I um, want to talk next about some of the, the tensor tools a little bit deeper in what they do, because basically the energetics that we're going to be pulling into these columns of light are things that basically we're going to be attuned to in what these columns of light can do. Um, so I was telling you about Slim Sperling. A few years ago, he came to us and he wanted us to put together this little contraption. And we're like, well, what does it do? And so we're supposed to take a, a clear quartz crystal, and a sphere, and put in the center and to house and hold intentions. But that's what these tensor field generators do is that they will hold and house and broadcast intentions because this uh, is based on the geometry. Um, this is called in, in the UK, um, they call it a Genesa crystal. And there was actually a plant geneticist who discovered this geometry, oh, what was it, in the 40s, I believe, Dr. Langerman? And um, he, he discovered that um, there was the original eight cells of anything biological. And those original eight cells, as they come together, they create this geometry. And this is how he interpreted it, is in this specific geometry. Uh, and they call it a Genesa crystal. And it's just basically four rings that are interwoven into the shape. And they're fun because you can collapse them and wear them as bracelets and all kinds of fun stuff. But where a tensor ring creates a column of light, when you put it into here, I coined this thing a tensor field generator because it basically creates a sunshine effect and sends that out. Now, this one is in that golden fire frequency. So this is the one that is... Um, well, it creates a two and a half mile wide sphere of influence, about two and three quarters actually. And so within that sphere of influence, this is restructuring all the electromagnetics, all the, you know, all the electromagnetics that are floating through the air, dense consciousness, all the ghost waywards, all of that stuff. Um, so these have been really fantastic, but when, when this, um, when these golden fire first came out and we were getting these out into the world three years ago, then there was um, the rollout of the 5G millimeter wave that occurred very first during the Super Bowl in 2018. And after they had that in the Twin Cities area, we had a lot of holistic practitioners who were having people with um, electromagnetic sensitivity issues. And you know, so we were like, wow, okay, so this golden fire should take care of it. And then some gal called me and said, well, we have all your tools in our home and we're still having all these electromagnetic sensitivity issues. Most time this occurs, it is because the person and their beliefs and everything else, kind of like the cell phone towers are producing a beneficial frequency until you, until you go into fear about it. That's usually when people get the tools and they're not working. It's because they are creating that. Um, but everybody else that's in that whole area, they're working just fine for them. Um, because we are powerful creators, especially when we're in the head and out of fear. So we found that that was not the case here. That we found that this 5G millimeter wave was actually connecting into the electrical and it was broadcasting through the electrical of the home. And it was just intense. So we just simply anchored in more light into this golden fire generator, into all of them, into the etheric templates. And then it transformed even that 5G millimeter wave. So I was at um, Mary Hardy's event here a few years ago. And on the way home, I stopped in Chicago because that was the first rollout. And I did some studies there, some, some playing around downtown with this 5G millimeter wave. And, you know, 2020 was our best year for Twisted Sage Studios for sales for the fact that everybody was in fear and, oh my, it's the 5G that's frying us and creating COVID and all this stuff. There's so much fear around 5G because it's so unknown. The thing is, is that 5G millimeter wave, it's, it's um, let's say that this is a 5G transmitter and these waves go straight out from here. They don't 
broadcast or go out spherical like a cell phone tower. These waves go straight out and they only go for about 200 feet. And they won't go through a piece of paper or a glass window, anything like that. So people were having such fear about this 5G millimeter wave because yes, you stand in front of this thing and you're not in your power and you're just and you're unaware of it, yeah, it can, it can do some harm to the electromagnetic body and to the physiological. But it is such a limited technology that they're not putting 5G in the satellites and beaming it because it only goes 200 feet. This 5G millimeter wave is a very limited technology. 5G simply means fifth generation. And yes, your fifth generation Wi-Fi router, I noticed it when it came into my house. I could, I could tell it switched. But anchor a column of light, put a Wi-Fi ring on it, whatever it is that you do, and it is absolutely fine and safe because it is simply electromagnetic. All we are doing is bringing harmonizing electromagnetic fields. And that's what we're doing with our own being now. Now that you guys have your Merkabas activated, as long as you don't fall into fear and be like, oh man, that 5G, you're going to be perfectly fine. It's not going to affect you. It transforms it. Um, so anyway, just... Uh, just kind of want to talk about that 5G and this golden fire because now then, when we create these columns of light that we're going to do, we're bringing through this energy and it will transform even a 5G millimeter wave, which you don't find very, very f far and few in between. Um, it's mostly just the basic fifth generation um, you know, communications. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up so that that's going to be included. And some of the other things that are included are this particular object here. When we first made this, um, Slim was showing us that one, it was working on GMOs, genetically modified organisms, such as corn, that um, basically you can take seeds of a GMO plant and you can expose them to this energetics and then that seed, when it turns into a plant, it has no GMO. It has basically gone back to its original DNA in the highest and best. So then if you have seedlings, the seedlings that are from a GMO seed, if you expose that to this energy, then by the time that plant reaches fruition, the seeds are back to normal natural. So there is a way, because I know that I fell into fear for a little while about the whole thing with the kill gene and the GMO stuff and all that, you know, with the corn. And um, it's, for, for one, we see that over the course of seven years, it goes back, it reverts back to the natural anyway. Because every, everything is, you know, the natural world and Gaia are very powerful, powerful things and it will bring all that GMO back if we just let it be. Um, but we can change it. So the reason I want to introduce you to this is because also this is in those columns of light. That when you anchor these columns of light into a cornfield, it is going to shift that. And remember, these columns of light will stay there indefinitely if needed. So anchoring columns of light everywhere is huge, huge, huge. Uh, because it connects into the core of the Earth. You know, Gaia is very much holding these columns of light. And, um, and, and so it, every time we anchor a column of light, it is raising that light quotient of the entire planet. It truly is. It's an amazing thing. So anyway, the energetics of this goes in there. And this was also one that is, um, he showed us creates rain. When we sat the first prototype down, um, we felt it going out in waves and we could feel rain on our skin and you could smell that, smell the rain, the negative ions. Um, it was really super cool. And this one was just made again recently because the, the other one I sat on a medicine wheel, um, one of the sacred sites there in South Dakota. And it, uh, it stayed there and then we never did make any more of them, but we did create these energetically that we just energetically throw them into cornfields. But now then, once you are basically attuned to this, I'm just saying this so that you know it, so that when we go to anchor those columns of light, this will come through in there too. Is that energetics that can shift GMOs and maybe create rain. Um, 
I've seen a 12-year-old girl move clouds right in front of me. I could, she, she can move clouds. You know, it is amazing. And all the weather that's going on right now from what everybody that I look up to and trust is saying is that it is a reflection of consciousness. That all this crazy weather, including the fires, are all just reflections of consciousness. You know, and a lot of people are, and some of these people are saying that mm, about six months, that things should just calm down as far as the weather patterns go. But who knows? You can't make predictions anymore. But uh, so anyway, it's, um, there's that. Oh, bless you. So let's see, what else fun are we going to work with? Um, I think we'll talk about the ascension pyramids and the, the grids that go with that. Um, so 2014 was the first time we made an ascension chamber. And it was basically, um, I actually have one in the back of my car, but it's a 13 foot tall structure made out of steel. And then there's all these copper rings, like those big copper rings you see by the door that come down over top of you. And you stand on a floor plate of that Flower of Life design that you see back there. And you know there's, there's all these components to it. And basically, it creates a toroidal field 300 miles across. You stand right in the epicenter of that. And it brings everything into alignment. Um, and that was our very first version of these ascension chambers. And then we created um, five different styles of these. One of them's like, a lay down style with giant rings that come over top of you. Um, then we have one that you sit in a chair that's at a 60 degree angle. Um, and then we started, I kept seeing these pyramids and wanting to make an ascension chamber with pyramids. And so um, it was interesting because during this whole entity clearing thing, when my sister found an entity that she could not clear, her team would take her to some pyramid and go underneath this pyramid and there's a big stone slab and she would, the client would lay down on the stone slab, the entity would turn into a baby and Metatron would come in and scoop him out and just take him. Very interesting stuff, you know, we see a lot of crazy things like that, but it just happens again and again. And um, then um, they start talking about the Bosnian pyramids and Brenda's like, oh man, that's where it is, is in the Bosnian pyramids and down underneath the pyramids. And so, and, and so I was like, okay, yes. And then it, synchronicity just kept hearing about the Bosnian pyramids, people going there to do excavations. And you know, there's this one guy who was in his late seventies, he was going there and he was hauling buckets of dirt out of there. And he's like, man, I've never felt this good since I was in my twenties down there underneath the Bosnian pyramids uh, because it's just so healing. And so, I was like, yes, I want to anchor that in. And so I was looking into it, and the 60-degree angle comes up again. And um, because our previous chamber actually sits down at a 60-degree angle. So interesting things. The angle of pyramids is what makes the pyramid do what it does. In Egypt, they are mostly this, what is it, 44, I think, is the side angle. Um, 52 is the side, but this outside is the angle that most of the pyramids in Egypt, which they all vary just slightly on their angles. So each pyramid has a different energetics and a different use. Um, and the pyramids are also grid holders. When those of us who created the pyramids, we made them energetically first. So we, so we brought in the energetics, the stamp, that column of light, that anchor that works with all the, geo, the, all the ley lines, and then the physical structure is built on top of it to hold it in place. So to me, my belief is, is that the Egyptian pyramids hold this physical third density reality in place, is my belief on this, because I do know that I participated in that. And you'll see the flower of life there. Um, so you guys all know the flower of life. It's the symbol that's on the floor plate back there. It's the 89 rings. And in Egypt, it's shown as having it contained within two circles. And all of the platonic solids, the platonic solids are the physical building block structures, the geometries that build all physical reality are the platonic solids. And, and there's only five of them. And some, uh, one of my friends actually found 
two new platonic solids that he knows are platonic solids, but they don't fit within that flower of life structure. All other platonic solids will fit within that geometry of the flower of life. I know this is sacred geometry and it's beyond my pay grade too, but I'm just sharing what information I know about this. Um, and when you take off those two outer circles of the flower of life, it expands. That is actually the fruit of life, what we call it, because it's expansive. It is no longer contained. And so I believe that we are stepping into new building blocks of new physical reality that's no longer third density. That we are stepping into a higher density of reality, physical reality, where we are able to interface consciousness and physical reality. That is my goal in this lifetime, that's really my only left driving force thing left on a soul level, is to be able to interface consciousness and physical reality, bread and water, there it is, instantly. Not manifestation, creation. And we are already starting to create by uncreating the things that no longer serve us. By doing the healing work, like with my sister. My sister that could come in and push that rib back into place. Consciousness interacting with physical reality. That is what we are doing healing to. So as all healers, we know that we work here that everything is energetic and then it manifests down into the physical. Just like cancer. Cancer begins in the emotional field, which most of us see beginning in the emotional field. It manifests into the physical. And so when we take care of everything here, this is where we're creating. And then we align that with the physical. And then we are creators. So that's that's, you know, that's where we're going with that whole concept. But back to the 60 degree angle. That's what this angle right here is, is 60 degrees. And there's the Bosnian pyramid is actually the main one is a five sided pyramid. And there's two of the angles on there that are 60 degrees. That's why we made that one originally that 60 degree angle. And um, because I'm not fond of the Egyptian style pyramid, because I still feel like that's limiting us. Um, that that's only that's just a little bit of my thought on it you know they're they're still phenomenal they they hold great energy but i think it's um time to step away from that but um so when when we were creating these first pyramid structures we created like a 12 foot tall pyramid with the 60 degree angles and we anchored in the bosnian pyramid complex into it now, the Bosnian pyramids, unlike the Egyptian pyramids that are connected to all these grids all over the planet and it holds this grid system in place, the Bosnian pyramids do not connect anywhere else on the planet. They are interplanetary, intergalactic, interdimensional grids. But the Bosnian pyramid is held right here. So that is the only grid point for the Bosnian pyramid is right there in Bosnia. Um, until we made that other chamber, because then it connected which is really cool. So that one is permanently anchored into the studio in Buffalo Gap, South Dakota, which by the way, we are just opening up an energy spa called the Energy Garden, where we have all the chambers. Right now we have people that fly and drive from everywhere to come there. You know, that original chamber, for me, I used to do tree climbing, um, power line tree clearance trimming, and then I tore both my rotator cuffs, and so I had to get out of the tree business. And then once I started to get into this and we made that first chamber in 2014, I stood in it for 10 minutes, my rotator cuffs were on fire and I've had no issue since. It cleared them. So we have people that claim that it clears cancer, addictions, all kinds of fun stuff. I mean, I've seen so many shifts because I used to facilitate, you know, hundreds of people a week going through those chambers um, because I would just take them all over the country and set up and just run people through and um, seen a lot of miraculous things happening there with, with all of that. Um, so with, um, with the newer chamber, we, we found that that Bosnian pyramid was still not high enough. So all of the new ascension pyramids that we create are, do, do have the Bosnian pyramid stuff in them, but so much more. They are containing what we call the field of neutrality. I mentioned that earlier where we're going to go to the field of neutrality to that space of all knowing. You know, that whole space will take a journey there. In that space, you know, and of course we always try to take those spaces and things that we learn and put them into the tools. So within the pyramids is where you can find that field of neutrality. 
Um, so if you have an opportunity here to check out one of the pyramids and stand in them, please do. We have a larger one down here in the little caf cafeteria area, and then that smaller sits one. Um, and they're exactly the same as this in that no matter how high up you go with it, these legs extend into the earth. And so um, I finally hung one above my bed and I wish I would have done that when they were first made because I started to sleep better at night and I would wake up in the morning all inspired and start writing and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but again, that's going to be that field of neutrality that we're going to actually journey into and be able to access. Um, so we will do that part. So we found that these ascension pyramids were all creating a grid. They were connecting to each other. And um, there's within that grid, you know, they create these little 13 inch wide grid lines that just connect to a thousand different points on the planet. And um, Basically, it's carrying what my sister calls um, a healing field. It's basically what she sees a lot of the phenomena healers pulling from some field, some space. And it is that field that is not only within the pyramid and being emitted outside of the pyramid, but also all those grid lines. And it's just a healing field that can be accessed. And maybe it's even unconsciously the soul accessing it. So basically, it's just bringing through more higher energy that you, if one you attune to it, it's there. Because, I mean, there is so much, like all the people, all the guides, and all the beings that are here, you might not see it, but as soon as you attune to that and start to look at that frequency, then you start to see them. Kind of like me with all that dark entity stuff. I was attuned to that specific bandwidth of frequency. And that's what I saw. So we each see and perceive everything in this non-physical world a little bit differently. But we can attune to these higher fields, like that healing field that comes from the, chamber, from the ascension pyramids. Um, so I was wanting to make something a little bit more affordable to create grid points. So I made this little guy. And this is a, a grid point, and it creates those grids. And then... I lost two weeks of my life somewhere along the way as I was creating these little pieces. And you could call them Organite, Orgone, but I, I try not to because I'm not a fan of Orgone energy because it's simply a frequency. It's, um, it's not conscious. Um, where any of this other stuff is, is like a smart ring. It's interacting with our soul, and our soul is the one who determines what comes through. Like an Orgone piece is just a frequency emitter. So that's why I try not to get these confused with orgone, which it could be considered orgone, because orgone is um, crystal in resin with metal, compresses it, creates a piezoelectric energy, comes out of it. And or organite is based on a person's intention and their, any of their energy that they put into here. So I, I do like some pieces of organite. It depends on the maker and the material that's in there. You know, but if somebody is kind of unconscious making it or... In a, in a pissed off mood when they're making it, it's gonna come through, you know, so just, but you can clear your organite pieces with a ring. It'll also amplify organite pieces with a ring, so, or you can do it with a column of light. Um, so this little quantum grid point, we use a plant-based resin, and this is, um, this is stone that comes out of the Black Hills, the white, and then we use the Lapita light that comes from Angel Fire, New Mexico, which is really phenomenal um, energetics. But inside of these, where I lost those two weeks of my life when I was making these, there's a little ball of golden light. And that ball of golden light connects to the heart of the earth. And so this is an earth-supported grid. Um, so basically, you can create grids. And so what we did when the very first ones of these were coming through, I actually was creating these for a gentleman out in Los Angeles County who does that million person meditation um, that they did at one in Washington, DC. They had a million people there meditating in 2018. And then we were supposed to do one in LA, which you know, then that was in 2019, so that one got canceled. We just did a small one in LA um, not too long ago where we built a 27 foot tall copper pyramid, ascension pyramid like that with giant Tauruses and all that stuff um, that we set up there. But um, these grids, are, we, we use them in Los Angeles to grid cell phone towers. So basically, where they create that column of light between it, 
you take your cell phone tower, you put a grid here and a grid point here, and then that grid goes right through the tower, and it basically does the same thing as if we were anchoring columns of light. So a lot of these tools, like these guys, are simply there for those who don't feel confident in anchoring the columns of light. But we're going to make sure that you guys feel confident in anchoring the columns of light. Ooh, can I turn the AC back on? The AC, yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so let's, let's see. So that's, so that's just more of the, the, the grid work. So I know a lot of you guys are into the grid work. Now, when we do these columns of light, they create grids too. So you don't have to use a quantum grid point. You can simply um, either anchor that column of light right into a tower itself, or if there's a whole line of them, you can anchor a column here and a column here, and they connect and they do the same with intent. Because whenever we anchor those columns of light, we just have the intention of connecting to all the other columns, and then it spreads out, and then it creates that network. So you can anchor a column of light, and that's fantastic, but if you have that intent of connecting to the entire grids, then it really, it's, it's even more expansive. Which is funny, because I've never taught anybody to do that one. Uh, you know, because I have several videos on columns of light, but we've never connected those columns. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, the new thing, is connecting those columns of light. Um, then also, before we get into anchoring columns of light, we're going to have the attunement to the chalice energy. Because this chalice energy, so I'm just trying to build up your entire toolbox so that when we do this column of light, everything is in there. So maybe we'll do a bunch of journey work right now, and we'll just... Um, the thing about the journey work and the, the steps that we've been taking all the way along, we've taken so many different steps, like bringing in your soul shards, bringing in pieces of you, of your soul, that you give to other people through lifetimes, and you receive little pieces of them, these little soul shards, and we carry them. And that is one of the things that we let go and release, and they get cleaned and cleared and integrated back into the person, and then all of ours are called back in and cleaned and cleared and integrated back into us. That is another one of those little steps, and we don't have to go through all of these little steps that we've done all along this way. We can go to right here and bring it all together. So if we actually had a class that taught you every little step of the way, we'd be here for a week because there's been so many different little steps. And so basically I'm trying to get the logical here so that we can step in here and realize how potent these columns of light are, that they contain all of these steps. And the releasing and clearing of soul shards is one of them. Uh, another huge one on the soul level is clearing soul contracts. You know, that we started to talk about earlier that when you come into this life, we have that contract with whoever we're dealing with in life and that those need to be just let go of because they no longer serve our purpose because our purpose is not the same as it was when we came here. You know, our purpose is follow your soul's heart's desires. Um, so, let's see, I was trying to think what else we're adding into these columns of light just so that you know. Um, well, we'll just go ahead and start doing uh, meditation and taking you to that field of all knowing. We go into the heart and we do a brain balancing and then we end up going to this space of all knowing and then into this field of neutrality where we find the field of universal peace. That universal peace is something that we bring into the heart. And the universal peace is what, if your body is going, so our bodies are going through so many changes. And sometimes the anxiety that you may feel is not the stuff out there, it is your body freaking out. And so the work that we've been trying to do is instead of reaching as far as we can out there, we're trying to bring that into the physical and anchor it here into the physical, which actually, one of the rings that we created here a couple years ago, we call the regeneration ring. And this little ring right here, the regeneration ring, this frequency, is one that we first started to see things being anchored more into the physical than what we've ever seen before. And there's another tool out 
that sits out there. It is called the cosmic sun disk, but it is a torus. This torus, it's not the bull torus, it's the tube torus. So this has a seed of life, the six petals, and it has another seed of life, the six petals, but it's ratcheted so it creates 12 petals. This was also a crop circle in 2009, which is really cool because I think this came out in 2008 if I remember right. Um, so this creates that true tube torus, that toroidal field that goes both ways and it spins. Um, this is made with those regeneration rings. And I, I always tell the story that I slept with this right above my head at night. I woke up the next day and I swear I sprained my pineal gland because it felt like it grew in size and I had a splitting headache and it was just, yeah, <laughs> totally. And, um, but it's bringing it into the physical. So it's bringing all those higher torsion fields, all those higher Merkaba fields. It's bringing all of that into the physical and it is anchoring it into our physical cells. And so, the, you know, all this stuff is happening with our physical bodies and yes, it does go into anxiety sometimes. And so when we pull in this, this field of universal peace, it's something that is just once we're attuned to this and we take our three breaths, that field comes into the heart. And so, again, we're making things simple of just taking all these things and even bringing that into the sacred space of the heart when we take our three breaths and then it's there. So like your golden fire, your sacred heart, that's there. That's not ever going to go away. That is in the heart along with your light because it is a part of your light, that, that golden fire. So, all right. We'll go ahead with a meditation journey then. <clears throat> so, I'd like for you guys to just feel your way into the heart. You can take your breaths if you wish, of just breathing in that unconditional loving energy from the earth into the heart that unconditional loving energy of sore soul into the heart. And just be in that column of light that's grounded, connected, and in that sacred space of the heart. Now taking that golden fire, using your imagination, and imagining that golden light, that golden fire, however you see it, and it flows up to your throat, and then right up to your pineal gland, right in the middle of the brain. And you're just setting that pineal gland on fire. Whew. Now we're going to imagine those infinities, the figure eight on its side, and it goes right through the pineal and is connecting the left and right brain hemisphere. Just infinity after infinity. It opens up that right brain, connecting, connecting all the way through. Now we watch that infinity going upwards to the higher mind, to the quantum mind. As you connect into that quantum mind, that higher mind, that's where you find that field of universal peace. Just allow that field of universal peace to come down into the body, into every cell, in between every cell. Feeling that peace in the body and it lands right in the heart. So you can always access this field from within the heart. Awesome, you guys all have it. Now we're gonna go back up to the pineal. We're gonna go back up to that quantum mind, to the higher mind. Then we're gonna go beyond the mind to that space of all knowing. <sighs> now we're gonna come back down into the heart again. As you are in the sacred space of the heart and you have a burning question that you would like to know the answer, pick one question. Now then, let it go because your soul knows the question. Let it go. 
go back up to the pineal, go up to that quantum mind, and we're going to step higher beyond the mind into that space of all knowing. And then you just let it go. And from there, at some point, you will receive your answer. Look for the synchronicities. Look for the answer. It will appear to you. Maybe not right now. As you go about your day or days, that answer will come. As we are in this space, we ask the soul to bring the energy of the chalice that crystal clear, pure consciousness light. The soul holds that and it brings it into your physical body. That energy of the chalice, crystal clear, pure light. Into every cell, in between every cell. Now check in with your body and feel your body. See if you feel your cells. Your body is the chalice to hold that energy. Now imagine yourself in your here now space and you are aligned throughout all time, space and existence of you, of your soul. You are aligned here and now. Bring your future, past, present, lives, soul aspects, soul particles all into this present moment. Transcending time and space. And now we allow the soul to release all that no longer serves you that you are ready to release. Programs, beliefs, emotions, traumas, contracts, oaths, vows, promises throughout all your existence, throughout all time. And if you need to take a big breath, be sure to do so. And this is the point of allowing. The more you allow and the more you surrender, the more your soul can release. Beautiful. Now we're going to take a little bit more specific journey. We're going to go back to the first time you were ever born as a human on this planet. At the time that many programs were put into the human, such as the program of suffering, the program of lack, of self-worth. They are all tied together in these sub-programs. Now we as the human don't have to see this or direct this. We are asking our soul to come in and weave through our entire existence in releasing these programs. So with the program of suffering that's released and all the traumas that were connected with that through all lifetimes, all these structures of belief that we created around these programs and traumas. And again, just be in allowing. Your soul is doing the work. You don't have to do a thing but surrender and allow. You don't have to visualize or intend. This is your soul doing the work. There's a big program that we carry out in the front of our fields, the program of addiction. 
allowing the soul to come in and pull that out of your field. And all the traumas and all of the belief structures connected with that program of addiction, as well as all the sub-programs. Beautiful. Within this energy of the chalice, the soul goes through all lifetimes distills the light and information from all lifetimes and the rest dissolves away. You no longer need to carry all the lifetimes of suffering, of trauma. All of your knowledge is there. All of your lessons, all of your knowledge and the rest dissolves away into creation. So any of those wounds that you still carry that are a part of your reality, let them go. They no longer serve you. Let go of all which no longer serves you. Let go of everything and let your soul decide. Let go of everything and let your soul decide what is in your highest and best good. And again, it's not a trying, it's an allowing. Beautiful. You guys all seem lighter and brighter already. This is good. All right, coming back to the physical. Bring your awareness to every cell of your body. Start wiggling the fingers and the toes and anchoring this all into the here now moment. You and all of your particles of light. So one of the stepping stones to this was bringing in all particles of light that are us. So as we start to see this giant spiral of creation of the soul, and it is made up of all these little particles of light. These particles of light are simply an incarnation, us, throughout this entire universe. And so when we start to bring in our light, we imagine it as just tiny little particles that, are, that we are, that our soul is, and that comes in. And each of those little particles of light that is our soul is a whole volume of information. And so that's really where we go to get any of our answers is the soul, our light, because it carries all that knowledge. We are all masters here. We just all forgot. We just came here to play. And now it's the time to wake up. And bringing in all those particles of light is what makes you a master because we've had so many experiences across this entire universe and we are powerful beings. So when we operate from the heart instead of the hamster wheel of the mind, we affect creation. We affect creation from here too, but not in the best way. So we paint creation from the heart. And dumping the junk, especially all the junk that we just dumped, holy smokes you guys, that was lifetimes and lifetimes and eons of accumulated crap. And as that's, as that's being shed away, we're a cleaner palette. And when you look off into the expanse of creation where there's no creation yet, and you look into creation, you are creating. 
But we can't look, we're not given the opportunity to look into creation much because we're still painting with our old palette of crap. And so we're cleaning our palette so that we can step in and create in a whole new, bright, beautiful ways without all of our dirty colors. So the column of, yes, so the column of light now is going to bring through that chalice energy and it will bring through that, uh, so everything that we're doing now is going to be in these columns of light so that here later on when we go soul to soul with others and we invite them in, we simply put them into a column of light from within your sacred space and then we just step back and allow, we hold space in a no time space for that soul to come in and for everything that we just did to occur with them if that is in their highest and best good with their soul. So that's why we're learning these techniques because that's going to become that column of light that we create. Um, so pretty profound stuff, huh? You guys all look really profound right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you guys could see yourselves right now because it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, let's see. So now where are we at? Let me make sure I haven't missed a whole bunch of stuff here. All right. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, actually one of our older YouTube videos, I, I did a um, YouTube with one of my friends who, um, for constructing a medicine wheels, these particular medicine wheels for, for water, for working with waterways. And so medicine wheels, yes, you're creating sacred space. And so most of the time when you find a medicine wheel, well, those who used to walk the earth, they would find sacred spaces. They knew where sacred spaces were at. And so they built medicine wheels on top of a sacred space. And that just amplifies everything. So when you build a medicine wheel, it is totally best to find a sacred space like that. But you can create a medicine wheel and you're creating a sacred space. So you can do it either way. But it's, it's nice to be able to get that extra boost from Gaia naturally. But... I still feel that when you create a medicine wheel and you are doing it from the heart with pure intent, you know, intent from the heart, that you are creating that grid. And vortexes? Um, so, yes, once you have that sacred space, that sacred space is, is basically held by Gaia because of those intersecting those geomagnetic lines. You are creating sacred space right there, and that intersecting of geomagnetic lines creates a vortex. And so, yes, you are creating that vortex. Now, too, I know quite a few of you guys know about Mary Hardy and the, and, and the work that she does. So, she does what she calls the Holy Grail Vortex. And... Um, so basically, they, they just use these stanzas and their intention and visualization to create these counter-rotating vortexes, and that's what they do for their columns of light, um, you know, is creating these vortexes. But, you know, and those are powerful as well, creating these vortexes like that. Um, I like the columns of light because they do so much more like all of the stuff that we're doing, and they're super simple and easy. And, and they don't require much, um, you know, much ceremony. Because ceremony is simply a way for the mind, the body, the mind, to do things. And the simpler we make things, the less ceremony we need. And so you, that's why we do the three breaths, is because it is a ceremony for us, basically. It is giving the mind something. So as you progress in this three breath technique, you can just do it just don't even take a breath. You can just be like, well, I usually take a breath. Breath is pretty important. But um, you just take that one breath and you're there. And you're there in the heart. And so we try, and again, we try to make things as simple as we can so we don't get here 
because if it's not simple, we go to the mind and we make it complicated and then our mind gets involved and then we just screw things up again, you know, because we're creating from here. And so the more we can stay in the heart with everything that we do in creation and in the work that we do, it's simple and it's easy and it's flipping powerful because we have all of the backing. You know, because within the heart now, you have the golden fire, you have that field of universal peace, uh, you have the chalice energy. That is all here. And your light, and your light, and all those particles of light. And that's the thing, is that was another huge step that we had to take in bringing in all of our light um, in this giant spiraling wheel of, of our soul and bringing it all into here. You know, because um, I talked about how that first ring, when you held on to it, it brought in your 12, your 12 soul aspects and you were all standing there together. And then as things progressed, we were bringing in like more and more of our soul aspects. And now then it's just beyond infinity that we can even imagine all of those little particles of light that we're bringing in. Um, and so that all is there in support. Um, so we have so much support not only of who we are of ourselves, but the entire universe, you know. We're very much on that leading edge of the expansion of creation and everybody else in the universe is like, yay, go humans, go Earth, you know. Everybody is here in support because we're doing things that affect the entire universe. And that is, we are transcending duality. And that's, that's what we're doing with this chalice energy, is we are clearing duality. Duality, and again, so if we see it that everything that we've created in the past, all of our past life trauma stuff, that was created in, in duality, soul growth and learning. You know, um, your soul family, when we had soul families, we were coming together and okay, well this time I'll be the abuser and you can be the victim. You know, and we, and we would always play that abuser victim thing, you know, throughout all these lifetimes with our soul families. And we're not doing that anymore. And so it's, it's huge. And then we get rid of all the traumas of playing the abuser and the victim and the energy stealers. So that's been another thing that's came up recently is uh, some kind of an imbalance, a disparity in consciousness where people start to steal energy from each other and you are not conscious of it. You can be a really phenomenal, nice being, but yet you're still there sucking energy and you don't know you're doing it. But if you ever come across those people that are just, you know, you just trained after you're there and, and they don't know they're doing it either. You know, it's just, it's an imbalance of, of consciousness basically. And how do you fix that? Self-love coming in, bringing in your light while well, self-love is truly the answer to it all. But it's, you know, how do you help people to get to that point? It's just helping them bring in their light more, you know, and when they bring in their light more than they're clearing away a lot of that debris of the old ways of victim and, and everything. So, um, and that's been another huge epif epiphany to me over the past year or so is that there's nobody to blame. You can't point fingers at, okay, well, my life is like this because of this or because of this or man, I can't be rich because of this or whatever, whatever it is that there is always something that is outside of yourself that's preventing you from being what you want, it is, it is, it's a block. We are infinitely abundant. And so as we clear away these traumas and these blocks and everything, we become more in alignment and, and, and the flow is there. Um, <laughs> that's funny, it took me down some other thing. I don't even know where we're at now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A lot of times I don't even know what's coming out of my mouth, but you know. Um, so. from some people. They had this conversation. I can manifest a three dollar atomic clock, but the thousand dollar seminar is a little different. Sure. So you just addressed it. Awesome. Yep, and, and, and you know, and it's, 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 it's those beliefs, you know, and, and a lot of those go back through lifetimes, um, and a lot of them were the programs that were put into the human in the beginning. Um, so one of the next things that we want to do is release our ancestors. So, you know, we always talk about our ancestors, and a lot of, you know, 
different belief systems out there are I call in all my ancestors to support me, you know, and that, that is, and that's beautiful. And, and you do have that support, but you also have the trauma, maybe a curse, maybe whatever it is, you're bringing in the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. And, you know, that's when we used to bring in our soul aspects, we were bringing in the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. And that's why in the very beginning where we could only see the 12 of us that were holding onto the ring, and then there was just a few more and a few more, and then finally we get to a whole bunch, and then we get to infinite. It's because in the beginning, we were bringing in the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. Um, some of you who have one of our older pendants is called the gateway pendant. It was the gateway to the soul. Now, this gateway pendant, would, it looked like the three ring pendants that we have, but it was a different frequency. And it was bringing in our light at that time more than what we've ever seen. But as it did that, it was slowly clearing away some of the stuff that no longer served us, but yet we were bringing it all in. And um, it's painful because you're bringing in all the crap too with every lifetime. And a lot, a lot of healers will note, especially over this past year or so, that all the stuff that people have been coming to them with is past life issues. And so as we started bringing in all of our lifetimes, you know, it'd be like, oh man, where did that come from, you know? And, and we'd clear that lifetime of that trauma that affects us in the here now. And so um, this gateway pendant was great because it held a space to where it allowed you to do some release, but now the chalice energy is allowing us to release everything fully, all the way back through all time and all lifetimes. So this chalice energy is huge. It's, it's a big deal for us right now. Um, but it's all over the planet. It's permeated everywhere. So, I mean, everybody's doing it. And it's just that it's better when you know what's going on and you can get through the work fast like we are today instead of having to peel away the onion because you guys all know as we've been doing our work for the past decades or whatever that we're just like an onion that we're peeling away a layer and, oh, I'm clean and clear and how another layer comes up and you just keep doing the work and keep doing the work and it seems endless because we are infinite in our lifetimes. And so we're just peeling away just little parts. Now we're getting to the core of it all, especially with the chalice energy and bringing in all of our light. And so as that light comes in now, everything that we brought in, it's cleaned and cleared and harmonized and integrated. So we don't have to do the work for every lifetime. This is a huge paradigm shift in the way people can do healing work. Oh, no, let's do ancestors. So the ancestors, of course, are, you know, it's a great thing, but you know, they affect our DNA. It's our, it's our lineage. And, and within the DNA, we carry all that stuff. You know, we, we carry the, the, the different family line traumas, you know, because we've gone back through and cleared family lineage stuff, you know, little things that I'll see in my daughter or, or in me, and, you know, we'll just clear it, find it in the lineage and just clear it. Well, now we're just going to go through and, yeah, we're going to clear our entire lineage, all the way back. And, um, okay, here we go. What's that? And our uh, in-laws. Depends on if they're blood or not. <laughs> I guess if you go back, we all are, aren't we? Related. Yep. Okay, here we go. We're going to go on a journey. So again, I'm just going into that sacred space of the heart. Grounded, connected in the heart space. Let's imagine your sacred space of the heart is a bubble. Bubbles are a very powerful thing to use. We're going to expand this bubble out. So imagine your bubble is like a small room where you can fit several people in. And we start to invite in our entire lineage. All ancestors we ask to step into this bubble. 
as they step into the bubble, everything that no longer serves is left on the outside and is cleared, dissolved, harmonized, released as they step into the bubble. As they step into the bubble, perhaps they just turn into light and dissolve. However it is, or maybe your bubble gets full, just make your bubble bigger. <sighs> Inviting in all ancestors throughout all time to step in and release all that no longer serves. So if there's some there that are just standing and nothing seems to be occurring, look at their heart, look at that soul spark, and imagine that soul spark grounding into the earth, connecting to creation. If there's any that don't want to come into the bubble, do the infinite heart technique with them. Send them love. And there they step in. Beautiful. And in this space, it is a no time space. Everything can happen in an instant. So when we work from the sacred space of the heart, we don't have to work for very long. If it doesn't occur instantly, then we just have a little bit more work to do, like seeing that spark of the soul and grounding and connecting them. Otherwise, for the majority, it just takes place in an instant. All right, coming back to here again. And if you have any really rebel ancestors that didn't come in, we'll, we'll work with them with the column of light after this. So, how do you guys feel so far? Did ever, it seems like you guys all had a good experience with that. Anybody, and does anybody want to share anything? Yeah, because you know, whenever you go through like one of those dark nights of the souls where you're going through one of those spiritual resets, and then you come back, you know, you kind of lose all of your abilities, whatever they are, your knowings, your sights, whatever. And then when you, when you make it through there, <laughs> make it through there, you know, then you, everything's changed. You know, you, you see clearer and you feel more and everything. And so many people are stepping into this space of knowing. Um, so I still see a little bit. Uh, I see what I need to see, but I don't see everything that I used to because my sight was geared towards things that I don't need to do anymore. And so I feel mine is coming in and I'm just patient with it into more of a knowingness. So, you know, and, and trust your sight, trust whatever it is that you see and feel when you're in the heart space. And, and make sure that when you are seeing and feeling something that you make sure that you're in the heart because you could be taken down a rabbit hole if you're here. So trust everything when you're in the heart no matter how crazy it all is, because we know how crazy it is when, when we see all these non-physical things occurring. So, just got to trust it. Um, so yeah, the, the whole thing with non-humanness, and that's it, is that we are so infinitely old, and humanity is not that old. Humanity is pretty dang young. And so, we are all super blessed to have these wonderful meat suits, that's for sure to be here right now um so let's take uh let's take a a quick break to do some things i would love for you guys to partner up and we're going to play with the large tensor rings back here and um and we can do that here in this room and we can just spread out wherever you want but just grab a person and i'll show you guys what we're going to do yeah that's amazing tangible energy and so later when we start playing the columns of light we want to create a column of light. We're going to first create one in your home. So that way, when you go home, and we'll make it a small column of light in a very specific spot, 
That way you can step in and out of that column of light and see if it feels the same as being in a ring. So that is our intention of creating a column of light that is so tangible that it feels like stepping inside of a ring. So, um, so somebody was just asking me questions about my sister Brenda. Um, so let's see, I don't know if I told the story about the, you know, working with cancer and things like that that she does. Um, okay, so I told you the story about pushing the rib back into place. So we've, we've seen people with fist-sized tumors in their lung. She will make a telephone call, though well, they'll call her. She helps them bring in their soul, bring in their soul's light. They wrap up with the soul's light, the tumor, the person's soul, not Brenda's soul, the person's soul's light, and two weeks later, it's gone. Um, seen people with pancreatic cancer sent home to die, two months later, gone. So with, with Brenda and, um, oh, I'm sorry, did we miss you guys? Is there anybody else back there? So we were just um, talking about how when we create these columns of light here after a while, we're gonna make it so that that column of light is tangible enough for you to feel like you're standing in one of those rings because I'm assuming everybody in here could feel that energy. Um, awesome, awesome. And if you didn't, don't worry, it's okay because the, being in those columns of light and working with this, you'll start to develop your feels for that. It'll just break you open, it'll break open all of those protectors and barriers and whatever else that you had up to prevent you from feeling um, all that buildup. So, um, and I was just talking about my sister Brenda and how, you know, we've seen people with fist-sized tumors. One telephone call later, it's gone in two weeks. Um, pancreatic cancer disappearing, things like that. So, I mean, it's, in all Brenda does is Brenda is just simply going soul to soul with the person and she's talking to the innate consciousness of the body and, and bringing all that together. And basically, she still has to talk to the person um, to have them allow this to happen. And so the people that come to her for the help are already allowing because they are ready. They're ready to shift. And so when you do work with other people soul to soul, they might not be ready to shift. And it's okay. You've planted the seeds and you held the space. And they will shift when they're supposed to shift. Um, so as we go out and start to do this work, it's, um, we, we, we do the work, we hold the space, and we let it go. Because when we're stepping in, we don't want to come from the perspective of the human that, oh, poor Susie, she really needs a healing. You know, and oh, I gotta help poor Susie, and here we go, and you know, and oh, damn, and nothing occurred. You know, I'm not a very good healer. And it's, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. The person has to be ready, it has to be their soul's path. And some people's soul's path is to, to do what it is that they're doing, and, and that is still part of, you know, we, we gotta honor those journeys of every individual. So basically, yes, that is a good question. Do we just allow that to be that way or can we ask for that path to change? Yes, we can ask the path for that path to change and that is kind of one of our underlying intentions. And when we're doing that soul to soul work and we're bringing through all these energies and knowingness that we are accumulating right now and we bring that to that soul, then that soul does still, um, it, it gives it more of a choice, more of a, um, being able to let go of those contracts and of that particular path. But we can't sit there and keep trying to force it. You know, so if the thing does not change, you know, sometimes we need to take a whole different approach to it. Um, you know, but again, it goes back to if you're ready and, and again, working with the mind, body, spirit. So the person's mind can prevent any of that from happening too. And so we just, you know, we just still have to honor every path, but just hold the space. And so when we're going to be doing healing at the end of this, we're not going to be doing healing and trying to make things come out the way we perceive them, because that is it, is that it's, it's a perception here that we feel that poor Susie needs, needs, needs the healing. 
poor Susie does not need the healing. Poor Susie just needs the space held for whatever is in her highest and best to occur. So it's still part of that whole thing of dropping the perceptions of what you want the intended outcome to be. Because when we start working with the soul, um, most of the time it does not come out how we intend it. But if we allow, it can come out better than what we could imagine. You know, you, you hear that saying all the time, and that is absolutely true. Um, so, uh, let's see, what were we going to do next? Oh yeah, I was going to talk to you guys about a couple more fun tools. If anybody's into the dragons, we have a dragon's wand, which is really fun. You can actually open up a space to where you work with the dragons. When we started working with the dragons, um, these are all phenomenal beings. I have never met a dragon that was malicious. They are all higher beings. Um, there are, I've never met a dragon that's malicious. And I've met a lot of dragons, as you can imagine. There's dragons that come out really pissed off about things, but you know, they're cool. You know, they're not, they're not running rampant and destroying things. And those that were, back in like the Atlantean times, they, were, again, were not operating under their free will. Kind of like all those beings, all those people who had an entity attachment, who were helping to create a lot of things in our old world, like some social institutions, things like that. They were entity attachments. They were working in the duality. I mean, that's just what they were doing. They were doing what they signed up to come here to do. We go back to the thing with Hitler. Hitler might seem to be a really malicious SOB, but he was a phenomenal soul being who signed up to do that tough work, as were everybody who participated. So we can't have a judgment on those things. Um, you know, we just... But with the dragons, the dragons have been... They're phenomenal. We work with um, all different kinds of dragons because there's all different types all over the planet. And, um, you know, we used to work with this council of six. And these six, there was like the dragon heart, the dragon sight, the dragon's breath. Um, you know, all these different modalities, basically, that the dragons have. And so they're, they're fun to work with. But um, I just wanted to put in the plug for the dragons that they're fantastic beings. They're fun to work with. And you can open up the spaces with dragon wands and work with those higher aspects. Um, I did want to share with you one other fun tool, and this was the first thing that we saw that was uncreating creation. Um, this is called the shaman's wand. I was invited to go to, to call um, winter solstice a couple years ago to speak on timelines. And so I was down there and we decided to make these shaman's wands for the elders there and to take them down. So we made these shaman's wands. and. I had been dealing with a hiatal hernia, which is the stomach that flips upside down. And um, usually most people have to end up getting surgery for that. But we would always pull it back down. And, and um, you know, a lot of people get these hiatal hernias. And um, there are, you know, so many misdiagnoses with that. But basically, mine, I dealt with it for three years. And it was always some emotional thing that caused it to herniate. And we just could not get it to clear. Three years I dealt with that thing. Um, after the shaman's wand was created, I laid down in bed, made a bubble around it with the wand. Two minutes later, I sat up. I could not find it was ever in existence. It was gone. That was our first time, that was my first time of seeing uncreating creation. So was talking about this chalice energy and how Brenda simply holds the space with this chalice energy. Now we have that chalice energy here within the heart. And we're going to put that into the columns of light that we create. And basically, with this chalice energy, you know, I tell you that we deal with all these civilizations of beings out there and everything. This chalice energy first came in, we were seeing entire civilizations uncreating. Entire civilizations. Entire worlds uncreating because they were not in alignment with non-duality. Uncreated. Uncreated. Entire civilizations. And then on soul level, when we first made our first ascension pyramid, we were seeing that too. That when you stood in there, 
it was like the soul was like this lotus flower. And in the very core was your soul, that very core of the onion and all the layers. The petals were all these lifetimes. And we saw these petals just starting to fall away. They would just, the, 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 so, the core soul of that would just distill the light and information out of this petal. This petal would fall away and dissolve into nothing. And that was a lifetime. And so we would just sit there and watch this occur that um, within this energy, and that was the energy actually of that field of neutrality. So it was the field of neutrality that we first started to see the soul uncreating its entire creation. And then once we, that would, so the, that um, field of all knowing that we went to earlier was one of the steps. And then that chalice energy came in and it is even more. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share some of those stories with you about how potent and powerful this can be when we step aside and allow and we surrender to the soul. And that, again, is just the biggest thing is just that surrender. And because otherwise, you know, I went through, um, after all the entities were, you know, cleared and I was kind of out of a cosmic job, I kind of went on a deep, deep, dark night of the soul dive, just layer upon layer for about nine months. And it was pretty intense. Um, and the whole time I was like, Brenda, help me. And she's like, you got to let go. And I'm like, what am I holding on to? You know, and I just was not surrendering. And um, then it was about a year ago. I was like, okay, I'm going to go on this getaway. I'm going to go to Las Vegas to this conference and I'm going to come home and I'm going to be reset. And of course, I didn't have my reset. So I came home and I walked into the shop and I was just like, ah. And I felt something grab my feet pushed me over backwards. I hit my head on the counter, had 17 stitches. I couldn't shave my head for about a year. And um, that was my spiritual two by four. That was my reset. And that was when I had to start realizing I needed to surrender. And when I stopped, when I surrendered, everything shifted. All of that stuff that I was holding on to that I did not know I was holding on to because I would not surrender. So, uh, try to help with that surrender concept. Um, no, I cannot. <laughs> no. Nope. Yes, you know, and I did not realize I was holding on to all that stuff that I did not know so tight because this stuff transcends this lifetime. It is through lifetimes that we hold on to. And so that's when I try to suggest when we are doing the, those deep dives and we're going in and doing the work that I keep trying to suggest to you to surrender and to let go and to know that those things no longer serve you. And if I can talk to the ego part, that's who I'm talking to when I'm talking to that part because you are in the heart, your soul and your body are there and ready and it's just still talking to that ego part that wants to still hold on to that. That is another thing too, you guys, the ego. The ego is beautiful. You know, everybody's like, oh, that damn ego, you know. No, the ego has, the ego is a part of us as, as we are here in these physical incarnations. And, and so we see that there is a soul level structure all the way back that the ego inhabits. And, and this soul level structure is something that's usually our drive, our motivation. And lifetime after lifetime, we come in and we still, a lot of times we'll have that same kind of drive and motivation for that same purposing and reasoning. And, and you know, if that occurs lifetime after lifetime, it is that soul level structure pattern. Now, the ego is the one that when we do this work, we have to ask the ego to surrender to the soul too. And that is huge because if we can tell the ego, hey, we're not trying to get rid of you. We don't want to do you harm. We're asking you to come along on this journey with us and to take a higher position a higher stance in your, what you're doing because we need the ego. And the ego is the personality. If you ever hear of people that have walk-ins where there's one soul that inhabits the body and then the another soul comes in and their personalities are still the same, that is that ego. The ego is the personality. That is, that's the structure of the human. And so um, 
that has been a huge thing of just asking the ego to surrender to the soul as well and that it has a new job description. But you're not the one as the human to give the job description because it's just the ego going to the ego. So we ask the ego to go to the soul, to surrender to the soul, and to step into its higher position, its higher uh, calling. Yeah, we totally can. So next time we go under, that's what we'll do, is we'll, we'll talk to the ego and, and ask the ego to surrender along with us to the soul. Um, so let's, yeah. To override that that we're not aware of when we're doing these, to just say I accept? Yeah, yes. Y yeah, what, whatever, whatever the, the verbiage is that you as the human can bring through, you know, I accept, I surrender, I allow, um, I let go of, I release, you know, whatever it is that you can say, because you're, you're talking to your ego. And so basically you're asking your ego to surrender and to let go and to release. And because again, the mind is that ego. That's the three things, the body, mind, spirit. In, in the mind is the ego. Again, the body is always on board in alignment with it is in the highest and best, as is your soul. And so then we just need to get the rest of us on board. And, you know, and in that whole thing of, you know, just, just the ego knowing that we're not trying to get rid of it or destroy it or anything like that, that we are sending it love, that we are asking for its assistance in moving forward, then it allows the ego to step more into that and to surrender. So getting the ego to surrender is kind of, kind of your homework. It is, um, you know, being in the heart space, even, you know, imagining connecting right to that ego. For me, my ego presented as a small child. That's how my, my ego presented to me when I first saw it, when I actually saw that aspect of me. Uh, and that's how it presented was a small child. And it was residing kind of down in my hip regions. And so just working with it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a fantastic thing to do. Um, we're going to anchor columns of light now. Unless you guys have any other questions about anything we've covered up until now. All right. Yes. You did mention that we should redo this when we're going to sleep at night so that the ego would fall asleep, the human would fall asleep, and the soul could do the work. So that this is another reinforcement of why we should all do it. Right, yeah, because when you, yeah, it's, it's, and that's it, because if you go into that heart space at night before you go to bed and you have those intentions, because, you know, when, when I was with my, my path partner at the time where we did all the big clearing of the grid works and creating this grids and everything, she always had such great sight. And I was like, I want to have sight. All I have is this knowingness, you know, I want to see. And so every night before I went to bed, I went into the heart space and I was like, please soul, let me see, you know, and I did that for about a year, and then boom, holy smokes, I could see, um, you know, so, I mean, putting those intentions and asking the soul and, and all of that before you go to bed is, is that's, to me, I feel that is the time to do it, and that's kind of like with the large rings, is that a lot of us will sleep with those rings above our head at night, because when we're sleeping and we're in those light, in that light column, it's fantastic, so you should put a light column on your bed, Definitely. And then when you put your light column on your bed, have that intention of what it is that you are looking for, whether it's your sight, your knowing, your understanding, your release, you're working with your ego, whatever it is, you can put those intentions when you put that column of light there. So, um, would you do me a huge favor and allow people to grab wands out of here? So, I think there might be enough wands in here for everybody to grab onto one. And I would like these back at the end. <laughs> um, so, they, um, one quick thing about the wands is that there's the large ones and the small ones. They are no different. They are the exact same power and potency because they are connected to that higher dimensional tool. We just make a version that is more petite and that you can carry with you versus what we call the practitioner wand. So, 
Anyway, this will be what we use for our attunement. And if any of you guys brought your wands with you, please do grab yours. What's that? Oh, no, it has to be the golden fire and light wand. And if we don't have enough, we have dowsing rods, which are exactly the same thing. <clears throat> so, so the quantum healer is actually the golden fire and light wand, but I would like you just to grab just a regular wand because that way we're not bringing through the dragon wands and the fairy wands and all that because the little quantum healers we have contains all the wands we create right in one. Yes. Beautiful. Perfect. Yay. All right. So with these, a fun thing to do is, you know, usually your left hand is usually your receiving side, but don't make that a rule. But you can actually make little, little spinning motions, little circles. And I like to go clockwise is the way I usually go. It doesn't matter whichever way you go. But try that out and see if you can feel that pulsing on your hand. I, you know, I, I do like to move mine fast because, you know, it just, to me, it, it's moving the energy. Anytime you are spinning and moving these tools, it is moving energy. So I don't know if you can feel that or not, but what that does is that opens up that meridian all the way from there to the heart. Um, so for a lot of people, this is what they'll do for that activation of the sacred heart is actually just wand their palm and then that activates that sacred heart. So anyway, that's just, you know, and that, that's a fun thing to do. And they, they shoot out these little fuzzy balls of light and it's fun to see people crossing the street and just wand them. And then you can, you know, and then you'll see them just kind of stand up and walk a little bit taller and faster, you know, so it, it's fun. Um, and that's the same with that infinite heart technique that we, that we did at the very beginning. Um, what the Elders 3 say about this, the Elders 3, my sister Brenda, um, is that when you do this with people like, let's say, a cashier, that you're in line and they're having a really, really bad day, they're having a tough time, go into the heart space and imagine doing this infinity, heart to heart with that cashier, and watch them shift. And so people that are out and about some driver cuts you off and is just being a road rager, 